Big kid energy, baby. How you doing? How you, how you feeling, all right? I know there's a lot going on in the world right now. Um, I'm gonna keep this intro short because I have opinions and thoughts on everything going on uh, from the COVID thing to the George Floyd thing and all that. Um, but my next episode is gonna be a dolo cast. It's been a while since I've done those. Um, that's just a solo one with me just just going riffing and just 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 letting it fly. So you get you'll you'll hear my thoughts on all that stuff. Um, but I hope you're doing all right. I hope you're staying safe, um, and I hope you're being nice to people. You know, uh, today's guest, people. Today's guest. This is. Th- th- I I I love this because I, before I meet with when I meet with someone about the talk, I don't I don't like to ask too many questions and get too deep into it because I like for the conversation to organically just kind of unfold and develop because then it mimics like a real life conversation. Um, and sometimes that makes people nervous. Like my guest today, Autumn Barrier, she was she was nervous as hell going in, but she fucking crushed this episode, crushed it. Um, Autumn is a photographer. She, if you've gone Instagram, you've ever seen any of the pictures, the really nice pictures of me and Rachel skating, or the one where like I have Rachel on my shoulders, and and she has her skateboard, looks all fucking cool and shit. I mean, we we were like maybe thirty percent of the reason it was cool. Autumn was the rest of the seventy percent. Did I do that math? Yeah, okay, I did that math right. All right, Autumn, I mean, when you talk about photographer, getting people comfortable, she fucking crushes it, right? So I'm like, hey, let me have her on to talk about photography and why photography and this and that. And yeah, we did that this episode, you know? We talked about, you know, what, like how she gets people so comfortable and all that. But the thing we got really deep into that I think is, is amazing is, is the struggle that Autumn had with uh, eating disorders and body image issues and things like that, which is something that I think runs deep. Um runs deep with females. This shit, this shit starts when you're a kid, comments made by parents, comments made by people, then you got the media, then you, it's a fucking, it's a fucking war, man. I can't, as a man, I, it's one of those things I can't, I don't think I can fully, fully comprehend because I'm not a female. Um, so I found this conversation very interesting. I learned a bunch um, listening to Adam, uh, Adam, oh Jesus, listening to Autumn <laughs> share, her, her, share her story. Um, guys, I'm, I'm like I said, keeping this intro short. I don't want to do the you know, sometimes I riff and be funny and shit like that. But check out the next episode. I'm, I'm doing a dolo cast, and that's where I'm gonna let it fly on some of the things going on, and then things that I've you know come up with in the past couple months of my life. Um, I am I did a challenge where I was gonna do 100 days of sobriety, I'm on day 87. Um, so I'm clear as fuck right now. All right. So there's all there's a whole a whole new world. All right. Sorry, I try not to sing on this, but God damn it, is it fun? It's so much fun. Um, guys, subscribe, rate, and review to the Fred Talk podcast, and also subscribe to my YouTube channel. I do vlogs. I have video of the uh, Fred Talk podcast up there. You know what the brand is, baby. We're gonna get better, and we're gonna have laughs along the way while we do it. So if you fuck with that, if you fuck with self development and having a good time, I'm your fucking guy. All right, I'm your guy. So follow me on YouTube. It's Freddie Valoy. Um, and without any delay or interruption or or just run on sentences and and just keep talking and just get to the fucking episode freddy <laughs> guys without any further ado i give you autumn barrier welcome to fred talk where if you're not learning hopefully you're laughing Welcome to Fred Talk. I am here with Autumn Barrier. Autumn, how you doing, girl? I am doing good since I'm on the different end of this. I'm not, I'm already nervous. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll, you'll, you're going to do fine. You're, you're a badass, Autumn. You got a, you got a full sleeve there. You'll be okay. It's, it's all front. It's all ink. It's like, it's all, I, I drew it before I got on here. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what, so what got, like, when did you first know, like, hey, I want, I think I want to get into photography. Um, well, when I got into photography it was really after my daughter was born. Um, and even, even before that, I feel like it goes into a deeper rooted situation to where when I was younger, I was 16 years old. Um, I ended up starting with wanting to change for my high school, um, I guess for the last year, senior year of high school. And throughout life, my dad and my mom always had issues with, um, I guess, talking down to one another. And so it led to where my dad would call my mom, uh, you know, a fat ass. And in, in some situation, I would want to be out of my dad's uh, line or yeah, line of fire and didn't want to be that one person where he would say that to me. 
So with that and, and going into senior year, I wanted to do something drastic as far as um, I was a chubby kid in the beginning. I was always made fun of. Um, never had any friends, still didn't have any friends even after senior year, but it didn't matter. Um, I went in there and decided I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to do something different. So I went in thinking, and I didn't even know what I was doing at the time, but I went in thinking that 500 calories was going to be a good limit for me. Um, my dad 500 and my mom, calories total for the day? Hell yeah. And if I, oh, and if wow. it was, what's funny is I would actually have a journal and I would keep track of so I could make sure I was accountable for what I ate. And if I was lower or below 500 calories, I gave myself like a mental gold star. So that was great. Yeah. Wow. So pat on the back for me, right. Um, and then on top of that, I would end up, uh, my dad and my mom had a treadmill in their basement. So I would get home from school around 2.30 ish and get on the treadmill for around, no exaggeration, two to three hours. Three hours was probably the, the, the most common. And I would watch the Food Network channel. And at that time, I would be falling in love with Emerald Lagasse. So don't know what the fuck that was all about, why I thought that that was great to watch food while I was running, but that was, yeah. Wow. So, and, and, and that was all a response into trying to get on. Like, so that way you, your dad wouldn't criticize you essentially was why you, would, why you were doing it? Yeah. Wow. There was a, there was one moment where I felt like I think it hit hard when at the time I think you know uh, maybe not so much now but you uh, the the hairstyle of bedhead where you wake up and you have your hair all over all over the place but it was cool back then in the 1990s um, so when I finally feel like I got it I was in the bathroom in my bathroom for about an hour or so and I finally felt like oh this looks great I came downstairs. And my dad looked at me and he's like, what the fuck are you wearing? What's wrong with your hair? You're not going out in public like that. And underneath it all, I kind of laughed and said, it's, it's, actually, it's actually a trend now, dad. Let, you know, it's it's going to be good. And he's like, no, 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 you're getting back upstairs and you're going to go fix yourself. So I think from that point was what sparked everything to be like, I don't want to be anymore in his spotlight. So oh, from there, wow. yeah. it, it's It's crazy what like, the comments from the parents, like how powerful that is. This isn't the right. first time I'm, I've heard it so many times where there it's like, it's, and it's it, a lot of times it is, it does have to do with, with weight or it's some type of appearance. Like what, like as, you, you're, you're a parent now, like how has that shifted your, your parenting style with how you communicate with your kid? Well, so Lana is going through the um, stage where she is turning or she turned 11. So she's got where we did doctor's checkup and doctor says, you know, the, the womanly monthly thing is coming soon. So she's starting to become um, more bloated than normal. So in some cases, I think um, my ex is who I've had Lana with um, is very insensitive to it as far as he kind of just does it a guy way, whereas you need to approach it in more of a sensitive manner with a woman. And so I sit down with her and I kind of have to make sure that she understands that no matter what, she's absolutely beautiful, um, that what we can do is start a, um, maybe start more of watching her food intake and seeing what could be causing her to feel uncomfortable. Um, because in some cases, for any woman, but at her age with all the hormones, her stomach really protrudes out and is very, very noticeable. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And then, so, like, like in the moment, how does that feel for you? It's very. It like, like gives me like the worst possible feeling in my in my stomach because I'm having to think back what would my 16 year old self want to hear and be able to absorb and not take it negatively because it wasn't just anorexia for me it was there was another point where I added in bulimia and there was another point with you know with the um, added exercise that I didn't know was called exercise bulimia and I was doing all three at once just to try to figure out what was like what would be um, a good look for me. And I think I got to the point where I'm five, eight, and I got down to 85 or 90 pounds. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. Wow. And, and what was, what was your, like for, uh, eating disorder like that? Do, do is there a rock bottom? Like, do, do you, do you like, at what point did you turn it around? Well, after my mom had uh, multiple tries where she tried to like take pictures, like a Polaroid picture. And I still, still to this day, try to have her find it for me so that I can use it and show people. Um, but 
she tried to take a picture, show me that I was super, super bony. That didn't work. If anything, I saw more flaws. Um, but it wasn't until I got to a point where I was um, a waitress at a local uh, restaurant called Spawn Divots. And at the time, I was a smoker too. So, I mean, I was doing checking off everything great for my health. Um, but I was going to the, the bathroom and telling my boss that I was going on a smoke, a smoke break. And in order to do that, he, of course, let somebody know it was a lunch. It was right before lunch. And um, the way that we had to do it, the, the bathroom stalls were, were completely almost enclosed. It had like a heavy door. There was no separation from the ceiling to the wall and no separation from the floor to the, the wall. So you're kind of just like in a barricade like area and you almost couldn't hear the other person in the other bathroom. Um, but you would have to stand on the toilet, blow into the vent when you're smoking. So I had just got done eating vegetables um, and I look, happened to look down and I was seeing my vegetables swimming in a, like in a soupy oil and I freaked the fuck out cause it was like a hazard signal going off in my head that I need to go and, and get rid of this. So when I went into the bathroom, I went to go and do that and, um, a piece of broccoli got stuck in my throat. Um, and for about 30, no, it was probably a good 45 seconds that I was, choking, was not able to breathe. Um, I was jumping up and down. No one was in the bathroom. And all I could picture was my mom and dad were going to end up uh, not finding me this way, but having to hear how people found me. So the bulimia had stopped for a while. And then, and then as everything slowly else dissipated. How long did it all last, do you think? Uh, I started at 16. Not everything finally like dissolved a little bit into where I got like sensibility knocked into me um, probably about a year before my daughter came along because I knew if I kept this shit up, it was going to end up fucking over my body and I was not, never going to be able to have a, a child. So. so this was a year before you had your daughter? Yeah, because I ended up getting, I was um, doing less exercise um, as much and I was doing like an hour and a half or so. I was still eating, like my my friends and my coworkers would joke that I would have a, a lettuce salad with water dressing because that's, I barely ate anything. Um, but I, we got pregnant with my ex-husband really, really quick. And then from there, I just, it, it, the full, it went from a full spectrum from not eating to, to really eating for two people. So I, oh, went, wow. I didn't have any middle, middle ground whatsoever. So were you like, was it, did you, so you went to, from the, I guess the disorder to nor normal eating for two people? No, like, no. Or was it like overeating? It was like, I literally had a craving because, and I say I had a pregnancy craving, but it's because I never ate food and it was instant mashed potatoes. And for some fucking reason, it tasted like KFC mashed potatoes. I don't know if you've had KFC. But yes. Oh, yeah. That's absolutely. like the bomb yeah. <laughs> potato. <laughs> so I would eat boxes at a time. And by the time Lana was born, I had gained over 60 pounds. So that was fun. But wait, was that, that was a, that was a win though, right? The, the 60 pound gain or was that too much or? Oh, no, that was the normal. I think the normal way for um, a woman to, um, for her scale to go up is probably about 30 to 40 pounds. Oh, so okay. Going, and then going from like, I think it was at that time, like 110, 120 and going 60 pounds, even probably 70 was a huge um, letdown for myself once Lana was born um, because I had to look at myself afterwards. Oh, so, God. okay. <laughs> there was no human, in be no human being inside me, so I couldn't give an excuse as to why I gained the weight. Oh, now. damn. Oh, my God. And, and please forgive me. I'm so uneducated on this. On, oh, you're fine. On this topic. Um, other than binge eating disorder, which I think I'm pretty sure I have mm -hmm. because of wrestling and stuff and like just general addiction stuff. Uh, right. Uh, bulimia, anorexia. I'm, I'm pretty like uneducated on it, but I know a lot of women go through it. Um, uh, friends I have either on Instagram or whatever, you know, message me about it. And, and like, I, that's kind of the extent of, of, of what I know. So you gained all this weight. And then, so what was, what was your thought track then? Like after the baby, after the weight game, what, what, how were you feeling then? 
Well, what sucked was I was already, um, I, from after having Lana, I was in, um, she got in colic mode. So I really ended up going into this slight depression. We lived in a three story townhouse with two dogs downstairs and I found myself just locking myself. Well, not, I mean, mentally locking myself with my daughter in our uh, bedroom that was all the way upstairs. I just didn't want to fucking come downstairs. I was tired. She was crying all the time. Um, and then to be honest, after Lana was born, my marriage was practically done. Um, I didn't want to be in the marriage anymore. The reason why I feel like I stuck around as long as I did um, was probably just so that Lana would see um, a happy mom and dad that I was trying to put on, but first it could only last for so long. So afterwards I would get a um, body dysmorphia disorder that I still have to this day that I'm still constantly battling with. Um, but what was, I don't think I realized how many women and how many actual men have this disorder. And so I felt so alone in this. But uh, you, Body dysmorphia specifically, is, is that where you, you're saying that a lot of people suffer from body dysmorphia? Yeah, in some cases, in smaller, smaller to bigger cases, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, like I said, wrestling, I'm pretty sure. I, I felt like at one point I felt like I had it to some degree, but I know the bodybuilding community gets it quite, quite right. a bit. Um, what, what, what is that like for someone with, with body dysmorphia? Like, what is it like for you? The best way possible to, have you seen the movie Mean Girls? Yes. Okay. So when they're, when they go into Regina's house, into her bedroom, they go into the mirror, all four, all, all three girls are like nitpicking everything that they've got broad shoulders. They hate their nose. It's, it's a constant a re, looking at a reflection that really isn't there that you're just picking yourself. And once you've picked out one thing that you hate, you see another thing. And then you constantly go from your physical standpoint to go into how shitty of a person you can possibly be. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, that can't be good having Regina George living in your head. Like that just, <laughs> no, <not laughs> just good. that analogy right there. That's the, that's the, that really is the, a great way to put it. Also, awesome. That's right. great. Um, <laughs> so are eating disorders kind of like addiction in the sense that like, you're always, you're always, uh, something, this is like a lifelong battle. Now I don't want to say battle, but this is something that you deal with lifelong. Is that, is that how it is? Yeah, the the reason why I feel like a lot of women and a lot of men end up going on to an eat, getting an eating disorder is because they feel like there's nothing that they're controlling in their life. So the one that the one thing that they can control is what they eat. So I think it's an addiction as far as um, being able to tell your body and tell somebody no, um, but you can't eat that. And then it gets to a point like for me, for instance, there was moments in my life where I was with my mom and we were having a, a mother's daughter day, um, and she would ask you, "Hey, where do you want to go eat?" And it would have to play like a million questions in my head. Well, what can I eat? And then if I eat too much, where, where is a decent bathroom that I don't mind going and getting myself sick? And then it got to the point where I was like, I just break down and cry in the car. And my mom didn't really know at the time what was going on, but it, it, it's a constant struggle, but it's, it's, a, it's an addiction. It's really a bad addiction. So if someone is listening to this that has – an eating disorder or maybe they don't really know that they're, that they're on the precipice of it. Like what can you, what can you tell them as someone that's, that's been working on this for so for, for a little bit now? Well, one sign that they can look for is the fact if I'm constantly trying to figure out what the hell I'm going to eat at this time and this time and this time, and as far as you're living to eat, not uh, eating to live kind of aspect, there is a slight chance that you might need to just go talk to somebody and maybe find out that there are some underlining issues. Because like I said, I think that a lot of the issues had to do with maybe more of my father um, than being picked on in school. I think, um, I think it could have got away with being picked on in school or not being talked to in school versus realizing that I could be in the, my dad's spotlight and wanting to tell me that I don't look right or I'm too fat. And I think I just avoided that altogether because my dad was a very, he's a Navy guy and he was very OCD um, when it came to certain things in the house needed to be done, but he didn't want to do it. He put it on everybody else. But yeah. Oh, so, wow. I, and how's your relationship with your dad now? Have you ever talked to him about this? I may have talked to him and brought it up once. Um, and you know what? To be honest with you, I didn't bring up the entire um, 
eating disorder situation because I think my dad is the type of person that uh, he doesn't like to take blame. Um, and he grew up with a mom and a dad who did that with him. So I, I feel like he got that from his mom and dad. But I think if I'm not, not mistaken, I approached him about um, when I was 18, I smarted off to him one time. And that was all I needed to do because he uh, basically put me up against the wall, choke pulled, um, hand to my throat kind of ordeal. And I'm like, oh, I'm done. I don't want to do that anymore. So, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> no, that, yeah, that, that's, I, I just, I, um, I don't know. I, from a, I, I can't imagine from a female's perspective, be it like having it come to that with your dad. I, I just, the, the feeling of like helplessness that could probably come along with that. Um, I, I have a, my, fa my father is, is, is in the similar vein. He wasn't a Navy guy. He was a drug dealer, but he was one of these people that he, to him, he could never be wrong. Um, you know, he, he does not take accountability. Um, I don't talk to him anymore because, um, when he got out of prison, he beat his mistress and yeah. So I, I, I literally spent 30 minutes on the phone at the 30 minute mark. I remember looking at the phone. I was already 30 minutes into explaining to him why it's not okay to physically abuse his, his, he was already, he's, he's married and he had a mistress why he can't abuse his mistress. And then I, I tried to like level with him and connect on the, on the level of like, Hey, listen, this reminds me of when I was a kid and he used to beat my mother, you know, thinking that that would be like, he'll be like, okay. Cause he loves me so much, you know? So he claims. And I, and I thought I'd connect with him and he immediately went into why it was justified why he did to my mother. And I was like, I, and that set off a whole thing for me. It took me like two years of therapy to get over it and I'm over it now. And I don't talk to him anymore. Um, but I just, you know, it's, it's so funny too, because, you know, old school or different cultures, they'll be like, well, that's your father. You know, I'm like, I'm like, Whoa. I'm like, excuse me. Like, who do I look like hanging out with someone that beat the shit out of my mom and isn't sorry for it? Like, would you hang out with anybody that's, like no, that? No, true. You know, like, no. so I, yeah, I don't talk to him anymore. So I, I, I empathize with you on, you know, that. That, that level of like just sometimes you just can't get through to people and you have to understand that this is their setting and for you to move forward you kind of have to like it's 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 weird like how do, how do you reconcile that like do, do you, you like forgive him and move forward or we don't have that great relationship because he's still the same person that he was before there he lives in florida now um it's the type of and you're probably maybe your dad would would have really done the same thing whereas he's a grandfather now he feels as the grandchildren and the children should come to him he should not have to come to us and it's been five years we've been in this house and he has yet to step foot in our house he's seen a picture and that is it so he hasn't seen his granddaughter in five years yeah. Yeah. That's, that probably would be him. Oh, he, he got deported after he, he, uh, was released from prison. So he's not allowed back in the country. Thank God. Wow. But it, it would probably be uh, a similar thing. It's just as weird. Like I, I understand like, it's like the authoritarian, like I'm the, I'm the higher up technically. So you have to, it, it's, it's weird. And, and in today's day and age, like a lot of kids move out, a lot of parents move out and the stress of having to go to like different parents' homes and it, it's. <laughs> yeah. It and that's what we have to deal with with Lana. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's just a run around. I'm already like before me and Rachel even have kids, I've already told, we've told all the parents like, Hey, once we have a kid, all the, all the tradition, the Thanksgivings, they're going to be at our house. Like we're <laughs> try, at least trying right. to establish that now, whether or not that's going to go through, but you know, maybe we meet at some middle ground or something, but just trying to establish that I'm not, I'm not traveling all the hot spending my holidays in a car with a kid. Like, <laughs> right. I don't know. I don't blame you. No. And it's super hard with the holidays with us with Lana because of the fact that she has to deal with, um, two, no, probably about four Christmases, four Thanksgivings, because when she's, um, over at Casey's on Thanksgiving, she then, or we actually miss her on Thanksgiving, but, um, she then has to go and celebrate it at his parents, her parents. And then when we finally get to somewhat celebrate it, maybe just a little bit before, then they, she has to celebrate it with us and then possibly with her, our, um, my mom and, um, his mom. So it's like, God, she's got so many personalities that she's got to take hold of when she's at everybody's house. <laughs> I wonder how that's going to affect that generation of kids. Like, you know, like, <laughs> 
as long as she keeps open and honest to me, and that's the one thing I've tried to express to her that may, you know, that it would be great if you can just, if I, if you have one person that you can appoint to, as far as keeping a trust level at, I would be so honored to be that person. And I've made sure to make a common ground that her and I are going to be able to talk whatever she wants to talk about. Oh, that's great. I feel like that's yeah. a huge, huge start, like a huge head start for parents. Right. I don't know. Oh, I'm, yeah. take, I'm taking notes. Whenever I talk to people who have kids, I'm always like, oh, I like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to use that, you know? <laughs> yeah. If you have a boy, if you guys have a boy and or I would highly recommend, of course, you being that person. And if you guys have a girl, let Rachel do it. Oh, nice. And then let Rachel be the messenger and vice versa. So that way nice. that you guys are in the loop. Do you guys do therapy at all or anything like that or? As a like uh, parent therapy or just therapy in general? Uh, both. Yeah. We don't do any parent therapy. It was brought up when we were t- when we were doing court, uh, like separation and, and getting custody and stuff. Um, but you know, Corey and I have actually talked about maybe possibly doing couples therapy, and not because we absolutely need it. We are like at our wits end with each other. It's the fact that we just want to constantly grow with one another. Oh, I, I as. Rachel and I, we got into therapy when we got back together after the breakup and we still go for that same reason. I look at it as like the gym for the relationship, you know, like you don't stop going to the gym after you get in shape. Right. I mean, some people do. I have, I get fat again, you know, but that that's, the, <laughs> a, a, I, I've been fat four times in my life. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but yeah, that's how I look at it. We don't go as often, but we still go. And, and cause then there's things like, I feel like outside of the relationship that you guys have to deal with either an ex, you know, you know, uh, 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 parents not setting boundaries to parents, things, there's things outside of just you too, that can also it, like, I don't know, it helps having that like third person to help you communicate things to like, you know, a parent or the in, in law or anything like that. So, um, right. Yeah, highly and- recommend it. Yeah. Well, in no relationship, as much as you want to like say and focus on, hey, you know, communication is key. There is going to be a certain point where, you know, you let things go because they're so minor and it's great to be able to have some kind of an outlet to talk to somebody with that other person in the room and say, hey, this really bothered me. This really affected me and be able to approach it that way versus feeling like the either the wife or the husband is constantly nagging at that one person all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Or there's like there's relationships I've observed where like they feel like the other person's out to get them almost. It feels like I'm like, what, what are you in? Like, what, (laughs) like, right. I I feel like if you just have the understanding, like, Hey, we both love each other. We're not trying to uh, take advantage. And unfortunately there are a lot of relationships where people do take advantage, but if you have the understanding, Hey, I love you. We're going to work through this. That was, that was a huge, um, a huge, uh, uh, what is it? Milestone in me and Rachel's relationship it was after we got back together we're about a year in, we were laying on the bed and I had said, I was like, listen, I was like, I love you. You love me. I'm not trying to, you know, we're, we're you know, we're, we're trying to figure this whole thing out together. I was like, let's try to communicate at the most, at the rawest level that we can, even if it's a thought that you haven't even fully thought out and you're not sure if you should say it, let's say it. I'll, I'm going to do my best to not get, take, be, get defensive or anything like that. And let's work through the idea together, even if it's half baked. Um, yeah. And that, it, that I would say that that was one of those things that helped get our relationship to the next level. Cause then you start to, sometimes you start to realize like those things that you let out, you're like, Oh, that's, that's ridiculous. Like that wasn't even, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right. You're recording that you did with Rachel, uh, that she asked you questions was absolutely awesome. So genuine, so in depth with making sure that you guys got down to the root of everything and being able to be vulnerable with each other in front of everybody was awesome. So awesome. Thank you. Thank you. It's, um, I didn't realize how much that was going to resonate with people. I would say that that episode, those breakup episodes were a few of the couple that resonated the hardest with, with the, with the listeners. Um, and I'm, I'm fortunate enough to grow up in a household. I didn't grow up with my biological father. I grew up, my stepdad and my mom raised me and it was a very open household in in communication. Um, so we weren't, I was never afraid to talk to my, having like the sex talk, any of that stuff, like with my mom was, it was no big deal. Kids from like my friends from the neighborhood would come over and tell my mom their problems. So it was a place where I could talk to my mother. And that's why I think I'm so open with my stuff and I guess why it works with the podcast and all that. I'm like, well, cause now I'm starting to see that it is really hard, especially for men 
to open up about things like, you know, their feelings, their problems, not being good at something, especially men at a certain age, like guys after 30, some of them can't deal with just not being good at something. They don't want to try new things. They don't want right. to, you know, so I feel like I, I have this privilege of, of being free to, to, to express. So I want to put it out there to show that a guy, an alpha guy can have problems. He can, you know, admit when he's wrong, shit like that. And by no means am I perfect. I have problems with patience and all that shit we talked about before we started the episode, but <laughs> just to show that like, we're, hey, we're all doing the work here, you know, like. <laughs> Who the fuck said that the guy can't be emotional needs to get something checked in his brain? Because I think that's absurd that a guy can't get emotional. That's a really good question. I want to, I want to like, I, I never even thought about like where I, I, it's definitely like maybe some evolutionary uh, survival mechanism at some point that just doesn't Cave serve man. us. <laughs> yeah. Right. If I had, if I had to guess, but like, I mean, especially in some of the more old school cultures, like uh, you know, Dominican culture is very machismo. Like it's very, like my dad used to tell me, you don't cry. You don't cry. Don't cry. Like, Thank God he got arrested when I was eight because I was able to like, you know, <laughs> now I don't cry enough. I feel like I'm always looking for a good reason to cry. Right. That's why I watch like a good Pixar movie or something like that. Those usually help. Oh, yeah. So, so would you say that the eating disorder and your love for photography are somewhat like, are they connected in some way or, or, or am I off there? No, they are. And then what, what I've had to come to realization is as much as I uh, didn't see a lot of prettiness in me when I was growing up, I'm starting to fall in, in love with myself, if that sounds even right, um, because you can't love anybody else if you don't love yourself. Um, but I've had to constantly show uh, brides who are always criticizing themselves. I, I don't look right. I look fat in my dress. This, you know, I ate too much or whatever. And I've tried to make sure that what I see is that they're absolutely beautiful, uniquely as they are. Um, I try to strive as much as I can to get on the phone with my brides and make sure that they do know. And I don't do it and just say the words. I mean every single bit of it and make sure that the couple and the bride knows how awesome they truly are inside and out. And I feel like that's why I may have leaned more towards uh, photography and wedding photography, just so that I can be there for a woman in need in the most stressful time of her life. That's, that's clutch right there. So we're going back to the, you mentioned self-love, like what, what are some things you do or, or like uh, some good self-talk type things that you do for yourself for, for self-love? Like what is, I guess my question is what does self-love look like for you? Um, I have to constantly tell myself every day, um, like some really good affirmations that I am talented, that I am smart, that, you know, I don't, I only have a high school education, but you know, going above a high school education and going into college isn't me shit anymore. And I have to realize that, um, if I say anything negative to myself, as far as like, I say, well, you're, you're being really stupid right now, or that was really stupid. Um, I have to mentally tell myself to cancel that. And then I have to say something positive twice. That way it physically cancels out the negative thing, the negative comment I said, and then it ends with a positive note. Um, but nice. I have to, yeah. So it's one of it's some of those things and practices and what helps is being able to see my daughter um, grow and have possibly not having the same issues as I did, but being able to be there for her. And I feel like in that sense, it's medicine for me is to make sure I'm constantly there. And if she has any doubts whatsoever, because she has one time, I think said that she she does feel fat and I, I made sure that we squashed it immediately. Um, but that was because of the fact that uh, my ex said something inappropriate to her that that kind of triggered something that she felt that she was fat or something because he didn't approach it the right way. But that kind of stuff is really true medicine for me and affirmations and being gra grateful for things. And how, how did you squash that for her? What'd you say? She w it was, had to do with the bloating thing. And he, he came up to her and said, Hey, you know, I see that you're, you know, your stomach's really big, which is not the best wording that you want to say to a child. Um, but I told her that, you know, she's like, I was telling you earlier that she's going through a lot of hormones right now. She's getting ready to become um, an adult, a woman. So there's going to be so much stuff going on inside of her that her body just is trying to adjust. And that's one of the things that her body's going to do for those hormones is just feel bloated and that's totally normal and that I did the same thing. 
it's crazy the the um I do I, I feel like it's a lot like I, I, right it, is it, it like for to to because the 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 appearance thing for females seems deep it really is but, like you you're you're you're, you're battling not your yourself and then other women and then men and then the media like that that it seems like and it's like a like a it's a crazy battle that I feel like now today we're trying to you ever read the book Daring Greatly? No, but I need to. Apparently, I that's oh god, <laughs> oh my god, that it is a game changer. Anybody listening that that has not listened to uh, read this book, it talks about all this stuff, and it talks about um, essentially daring greatly is is allowing yourself to be seen and be vulnerable. Um, so, and, and she she has a section on um, what we ju- what we just mentioned here about uh, the how deep appearances for women and and all that type of stuff. But I don't I don't want to give give too much, but it's such a good book. It's very, it's very human. And it, it's, it, whether you're a guy or girl, it, it, it'll, it'll resonate with, with, with everything. I, I haven't, I haven't, it'll resonate with everyone. I haven't listened to her Ted talk. She has an 18 minute talk on YouTube on vulnerability that apparently is like, that's the thing that made her famous. That's the thing that went viral. I have not listened to that yet, but I'll, I'm, I'm going to have to do that, um, tonight. Um, but she talks, she talks about yeah. that and it, it just, it, just shows how deep the whole like appearance thing is and uh, you know what you guys are up against especially women um it's not not so much men men go through like another thing in regards to like uh feeling like they're enough uh, in in the sense of um right accomplishments and you know providing and things like that but um it's it's a great book it's it's a game changer for, for sure well, you know what sucks for women is one, we don't have the best support because women suck. Women are the most cattiest bitches. And I hate to say that, but we really are because we're so competitive with one another. We walk down the street, see another woman automatically. If we're with a guy, um, we're automatically thinking my husband or my boyfriend or whatever is looking at that person. So we already get defensive in that moment. Not to mention everybody tells like women tell each other, you need to practice self-love. You need to love yourself, love your body. And when the woman actually has the balls enough to step out and feel sexy in something that she is being self-love about and that she's protruding, or protruding nothing but like, hey, I'm accepting myself, everybody says, you're a fucking slut. So it's, it's, it goes back and forth and I don't understand it whatsoever. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's akin to that. Like when anytime somebody, it's like crabs in a bucket thing. Anytime somebody tries to have a come up, the people around them were uh, because it's, it's just rooted in insecurity. They try to pull you down. And that feels like an even amplified version for you guys when it comes to that. It's even worse than just like me trying to put out a podcast and, you know, hearing people talk shit. It's like, I don't know. It seems like so much more riding, but like, I I feel like that wave, I don't know. I feel like you guys are doing what you need to do to, 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 I guess, overcome that. Cause, and especially like, women calling themselves out when they're being like that themselves. And, and in that book, Daring Greatly, Brene Brown talks about that as well. You're going to love that book. It, it, it's awesome. Um, so wedding Man. photography, did you start off with that or did you start somewhere else and then, and then kind of go to that? Oh, no, I ended up going into um, – So I started with families because, of course, I was shooting my daughter at the time. I started with families and then from families went to uh, maternity and uh, newborns and then seniors. Um, And then finally, I had my first go on an engagement session, um, charged, I think, about $500 for them to let me shoot their wedding. After that was done, it was like game over because I have two people who are in front of me who will listen to every action I have to give them versus kids running around and you have to bribe them with candy and the mom and dad are going, oh my gosh, just sit the fuck down, shut the fuck up. It's like, no, oh my God, I can't do it. So it's great to have two, two people that will listen to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's huge. You could say the kids are like the training ground. It's like, it was like training with a weight vest and then you take it yes. off and you're like, oh, this is great. Like, <laughs> Yes. So when someone's like, are you going to be able to handle my chaotic family? Uh, believe me, it's going to be a piece of cake. They're drinking. Yeah, I'm, I've got it. We're good. We're totally good. And, I, and speaking from personal experience, when you do, you've shot Rachel and I, you are awesome at like making people feel comfortable. And my biggest thing with uh, pictures is like making them authentic, like real, like not only like, I, I think it's weird when couples and no knock if they do this, whatever, but I think it's weird when couples <laughs> have a photo shoot doing shit they've never done before. And I just, I find that odd. 
And so one is like doing the things that you normally do, but then you quickly got us into the mode of like the, uh, the questions you ask and everything into the mode of like, Oh, we're hanging out and you're capturing like a real, real moment, which I think is very special. Like, how did you, how did you get so good at that? I just had to realize that having a conversation was going to go further than trying to make, because I was doing those poses when I first started. I was doing like the and signs and all the cute, like save the date stuff. And then I realized when just having a conversation, I, I guess I can be pretty fucking funny sometimes. And my husband seems to laugh at some of the shit I have to say. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll just start talking to people and really get to know my couples more because that's how I'm going to be able to capture somebody by just asking questions and finding out their true essence as a couple. So as a comedian, I can, I like, there's a thing where I can kind of feel like, like what a type of person is, or like, I know think certain things work because of like, it's like something at a human level. Is that the same thing for photography? Like, did you see me and Rachel and you're like, all right, I feel like this, this vibe is going to work. Or like, do you adapt and adjust based on uh, the, the, the couple and like their energy, I guess? Oh. Oh, yeah, because usually for the most part, a lot of the guys don't want to take their pictures. So you already have to go into that mode as a photographer. With, okay, the guy may be difficult. So what are some things that have worked in the past that will break the ice? And it's usually some of the stuff that um, where the guy can say something dirty to her. And I've had guys that just don't want to do that. So I've had to like skip that step real quick. Um, but what helped out a lot was being able to study up on um, body language and study up on getting the certificate for micro expressions. And oh, when nice. you're reading people and being able to read what they're saying without having to really have them voice something has always been helpful. Damn, that's so cool. How, how long have you been in photography now? Because you're really good at it. Like, I think about 10 or 11 years now. Oh, God. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. They say that to do to find your voice in comedy, it takes 10 years. Um, and, and I'm wondering, because like, I, I could just, I could tell, I'm like, oh, you're like, you're locked in. You're, you're like, I'm, I, I, the way I think about it is like, I, I'm going to give her the keys to this whole experience. And, and just, I don't know, you just, it, it, we just had an awesome time. And I look forward to doing more shoots with you. It, it, it's, I don't know. It's, it's awesome. Oh yeah. We've got a shoot coming up. We just got to put that date down. Oh yeah. Let's Especially do it. Especially at your new place. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, we're almost done with the new place. Um, oh, it'll probably done in a few weeks. We got to put in like the shower fixtures and stuff like that. Um, and then put some patio furniture in, but we'll, once it's done, we'll, we'll put the, uh, we'll, we'll schedule a date with you. You guys would be absolute perfect to one, do the face masks and do anything that has like somewhat of like a, a whole body condom kind of thing where you guys would just do a shoot that way and just yeah, yeah. be completely sanitary. Oh, I would love it. Well, yeah, we'll have a, we'll have a bunch of fun being, being safe. Safety will be the, <laughs> the theme. <laughs> what, are, what are some other passions of yours? Uh, but, but other than photography, what are some things that you really like love or like or that get you pumped? To be honest, I think uh, what came out of everything that's in the past, I have fitness is like my huge thing right now. So this whole quarantine shit has really taken a toll on me um, as far as emotionally connected. I didn't know I, how much I was invested emotionally into my gym. Um, so having to be creative and come up with stuff here um, has been a challenge. But uh, Corey, I don't know if you know about the challenge, but Corey signed us up yet again for a 75 hard challenge. Oh, is that, that the uh, the first form of uh, Andy Frisella thing? Yes. Um, what what does seventy five hard entail? Um, so seventy five hard entail is you have to do two workouts. One workout has to be outside. Um, Corey has actually got a recording of me doing one. It was like raining and pouring. I had I was doing my second or my first one um, outside in the rain and uh, doing sprints. But you have to do two workouts for 45 minutes. Um, you have to do 10 pages of an um, entre entrepreneur book to learn something about, I guess, business, about uh, gratitude and positivity. Um, you have to take a picture every single day, which that is hard in itself for a woman to do. Um, and then there's another one. Oh, that you have to also eat well, eat and also a diet, like not the pizza diet, but like a decent diet. A de yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. That's, that, that seems so like, I feel like why, why, do, why the number 75? It's 75, 75. days, right? Yeah. Why, why that Fuck number? I, I don't know. Okay. Fuck if I know. 70, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no clue not, behind it. He, I think he probably just pulled it out of his ass, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, like the, I like that number. I feel like 75, it's like, because 30, it's like, you know, a fun little, like, yeah, we're doing a challenge. But 75 is like, for, it's like an actual, like you're past the two-month mark. It's like, it, it's right. I, read, I know people say 21 days creates a habit, but I read one other time in another book. I don't know if it's true or not, but it says like 68 days is actually the number to make something a habit, which to me makes a little bit more sense than 21. So I was like, right. oh, seven, yeah, 75, like you're over that number and you're like, you're almost doing, that's, you know, almost three months or, you know, a little bit over two of doing that thing, which is like. If you can do something for 75 days, you can probably do it for a long time. Right. Well, yeah, but he's and the thing, the way he's got it is after that whole thing, you then have another phase that you go through. So you keep up with what's going on and you're adding like a cold shower into it, like a 50 degree cold shower. And I'm not, I usually stop at the at the first phase. I'm done with that. <laughs> yeah. No way. Are you, you, do you not do well with the cold? No, like for women, like as soon as I get cold, I get goosebumps. Like I take so much time to shave my legs. The hair fucking goes right back. And I'm like, yeah. no, I'm not doing it. No way. <laughs> uh, Rachel, Rachel hates the cold. I do. I always end every shower with like, I put it to the coldest thing. I try to sit in there for two minutes. I love the cold. I love doing cold plunges. I love all that stuff. But I have yet to meet a female that likes to do like, like the cold like that, where it's like, ah. <laughs> I don't like the feeling where my nipples are about to fall off. I'm not down with that feeling. So no, I'm good with that. <laughs> or do you like the heat more? Can you like sit no, on the but beach? Other th oh, no, that's the thing. So I can't do a cold shower, but our house has to be at like 66, 68 degrees. Oh, nice. Oh, that's good. That's nice yeah. and comfortable. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. not good in the heat. It, the, the heat th th takes it out of me. Like d if it's too much sun beating me down, I get really irritable. That's where I get, that's where I turn into a little bitch. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's, I'm right there with you. I joined the club real quick on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. And then while we did the, we did the 75 or we're still on the 75 fast, but uh, not fast 75 challenge, but we did a five day water fast along with that because we were trying to be creative and that in itself was a, pain in the ass challenge as well you're fasting so. for five days we did we already did it nice what what is that yeah. like i have a buddy on instagram a high school buddy that's uh he's gonna start it on sunday what is that what is that like like day four um we th we kept researching that around day three was a good day to um where everything starts to you feel energy again um you don't crave the food um it's not true because Corey and I, as much as, you know, we do eat when we weren't on the fast, but we realized how much we did depend on making sure to get up and eat food. I would eat food within 30 minutes of waking up because that's what I was told that that's you, what you should do. Um, but after finding out more research, that's really not the case. We're technically as humans supposed to fast um, as far as like the cavemen are concerned. And we've been told that it, um, eating every two or three hours speeds up with the metabolism, which is not true again. Um, so the fasting, if you do the research, the benefits from it is insane. But Corey and I both, he lost 13 pounds. I lost 13 pounds. And um, the food that we eat now is basically paleo because we don't want to eat junk food anymore. Like it, it, we don't crave it. Yeah. It's crazy how fasting does that. It like it. And, and, and I found out that the reason the whole, the whole breakfast propaganda was created by the cereal company in the fifties. I was so fucking pissed off about that. Yep. <laughs> like she fucking corporations, man. Like, <laughs> right. Right. Have you seen the movie game changers? No, I have not. Is that the, the, the pro vegan one? Yeah. How, how is Corey, that? Corey, I, I, well, that one's a great, it's an awesome movie, you know, cause you go into it and you're thinking, okay, this is going to be, it's going to be shit. And they come up with some amazing facts and finds and all that stuff. But you got to keep in mind that there are so many, like we're about to jump on, uh, which I did not think this was going to happen. We were, we're going to jump on doing the carnivore diet. And at the time I was not, I was not for it, but Corey went on and I went on vegan because he had stomach issues. Um, and we thought the vegan would fix it and it didn't. So that's another reason why we went and did the fast to see if we could find something that he was eating. But ever since the five day fast, his bloating of, um, he would have nights where it would bloat 
horribly more worse than a woman, I think, um, until we went on the five day fast and that was totally fine. Oh, nice. When, gonna, when you guys, the, yeah. The, so the carnivore diet, and I think at some point I just, I'll try vegan eating just to just, cause I like to, I'm just interested to see how my body would react to it. Cause who knows, like that might be the diet that works best for me where I'm not lethargic, right. things like that. I'm doing macros now, which, which works for me right now. But, um, carnivore seems like an interesting one. That one's being pushed hard by uh, Jordan Peterson's daughter. Um, and, and it goes against a lot of conventional wisdom on nutrition. So it's like, you know, no, no greens. It's just pure meat. Like when do you guys start that one? We, try, we well, we try to, we're going to start today. We actually had a uh, steak, chicken. Um, the one thing that I feel like I'm not going to be able to really fully give up is avocados. I've fallen, I've fallen in love with avocados. I can't get it out of my system. Um, but other than that, I am pretty much game for giving up everything else. So I'm talking with somebody on Thursday who she has done it full force from, from tail to nose and eats the entire animal, um, which that is going to get take some getting used to. Oh, wow. Oh man. I'm I'm going to, I want to keep me updated on that. I'm curious to see how, how it works out for you guys. Um, we'll, we'll wrap it up here with the last question. Autumn, what do you think about the most? Um, what I feel like I think about the most is, um, honestly what I'm going to do for my exercise that day to, in order to keep it and keep it different because I, um, I've fallen in love with sprints again and, uh, intervals. Um, but other than that, just, I'm always as a woman constantly thinking of that and what is going to help me in the long run as far as my body and what can I intake. So, as a, as much as I, I hate to say it because probably women say it all the time is that um, I constantly think about food and uh, and workout and exercise. That's what I do. <laughs> That's me. I feel you. I definitely. I don't think about exercising as much, but I definitely think about the food portion a lot myself. So <laughs> I've seen your. It was your Corey was like, "Did you see Freddie eat the ice cream with the Fruit Loops?" I'm like, "No, but I need to go and check this out." And I was so envious of you. So oh, envious. Yeah, it's uh, it's a, it's my new invention. Um, cause, <laughs> cause I did so, so with ice cream. I I started like my favorite ice cream is vanilla cone with rainbow sprinkles from Mr. Softy. It just it brought me back to my it brings me back to my childhood, New York City, when the ice cream truck would come wow. around. And then when I got to college, that was right around the time Col Cold Stone started getting big. So I I did that oh, whole my. like crazy ice cream thing, and now I'm back to just vanilla ice cream with sprinkles. I've recently added Fruit Loops, which adds to the experience, and it's not overkill. But I feel like I did ice cream the way right. like uh, the way like a girl would do, like you know, uh, like maybe a girl from a small town. She goes to college, she sleeps with some black dudes, she sleeps like outside of her race, and then <laughs> and then then she comes back after after when she <laughs> when she graduates college, she gets married to a white dude. You know, it's a white girl from a small town in Iowa. This is what I'm picturing. And now she comes back and now she's married to a white dude. Yeah. She comes back to what she's comfortable with. <laughs> oh my God. You know, the fun thing about the ice cream and cookies is that when I, if ever I indulge it again, I only eat the, the crunchy stuff out of the ice cream and I will only pick out like the chocolate chips out of the cookies. So that way I feel mentally that I have not eaten the whole cookie. There you go. Whole, yeah. Whole <laughs> you got to. After the oh carnivore diet, you got to treat yourself to a cookie. Oh, you know it. I've already got it planned out. It's going to be planned out like epically. <laughs> Eight chip cookies is all it's going to be. Oh my God. Autumn, thank you so much. This is like, this is an awesome podcast. Thank you for opening up about, uh, you know, the eating disorder stuff and all that. This is like, yeah, I think people are going to be able to take so much from this. Where can, uh, where can people find you? Uh, so right now I have an Instagram for, um, it's autumn Harrison photo, which is my photography. And I literally just started up a, um, it's autumn barrier with an E, uh, B E R R I E R. And it's literally going to be a whole Instagram about the eating disorders and what women go through and stuff like that. And hopefully it's going to lead into my book that I'm writing. So, holy shit. Hell yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Well, I got to have you back on then. I got I got to have you back on. Um yeah, I want to yeah, we'll catch up and talk about how the book's going and stuff like that. So Oh, yeah. Of course. I would love that. <laughs> awesome. All right, before we go, you got 10 second message you got to give the Fred Talk listeners, all right? Ready? 
go. 10 seconds. Okay. Um, make sure as a woman that just know <laughs> that you need to, when you're looking at stuff to eat, that you are considering the fact that if you're looking at diets, that the diets that um, women have come up with has been solely based on them, not on you. So do your research and do the research for yourself, not for everybody else. Oh, I love that. I love that, everybody. <laughs> Autumn Barrier with dropping the knowledge gems throughout this whole podcast. Thank you so much, Autumn. Um, guys, remember to subscribe, rate, and review to the Fred Talk podcast. And then also check out the YouTube channel, uh, Freddie Valoy on YouTube. Uh, Autumn, thank you so much. Oh, no, thank you.